Assalamu alaikum. It has been my experience in applying the organic Quranic methodology and the Abrahamic locution for a number of years now that every time we approach a challenge or an issue where some scholars were of the opinion of A and another bunch of scholars are of the opinion of B, it turns out that both of them were really wrong and the Quran was not talking about the issue as they approached it. So their perspective from the very beginning was wrong. A clear example for us was when we discussed the story of Isa in the series on Isa ibn Maryam and we discussed the concept of crucifixion. Was he crucified? Was he not crucified? Was he killed on the cross or was he not killed on the cross? And some scholars said this and some other scholars said that and to this day they continue to debate and argue. We proved and it turned out that the Quran never discussed the death of Isa ibn Maryam let alone whether or not he died by crucifixion or not. Another example is about the authoritativeness of the narrations, the narrations, those so-called hadith, that some scholars say hadith must be authoritative and we should understand it and apply it blindly. And other scholars said, no, the hadith cannot be authoritative because of its transmission problems and because of the multiple conflicts in the body of narrations. It turns out, as we have proven, that Muhammad was not even a Nabi for the followers of the Quran. He was a Nabi for Bani Israel. And therefore what he said in terms of explanations mattered to them, not to us, the followers of the Quran. To us, he was a Rasul. And therefore, a Rasul is only required to deliver the message itself, the Quran, the scripture, so to speak. And thus we find that whenever the Quran discussed an issue, the perspective of the Quran is foundationally different than either camps discussing this issue, either providing opinion A or providing opinion B. In this segment, we find the exact same issue. When we discuss whether or not Muhammad coveted his servant's Zayd wife, her name was Zainab, when we discuss this issue, we find that the Quran is not even remotely addressing this issue and is talking neither about Zayd nor about his wife and so on and so forth. So let's get started. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. This is segment YT149. In this segment, inshallah, we're going to answer this very critical question. Did Muhammad covet Zainab, his servant Zaid's wife? We're going to answer several questions. How to understand Ayah 3337, where the story of supposedly Zaid's wife is mentioned. And then we're going to deal with why did the scholars of traditional tafsir and by extension, the translations of the Quran mess up this story in such a massive way. And then we're going to follow up with a discussion of the opening paragraph of Surah Al-Ahzab. And then to conclude, we're going to have a few comments about the malignment of Muhammad Wasallam and the negligence of the traditional tafsir and translations. And you're going to see this is a significant conclusion that is extremely relevant to any serious student of the Quran. In this segment, we're going to provide, as I said, the final answer or the correct translation, so to speak, and interpretation for Ayah 3337. And we're going to see that it has nothing to do with marriage or the story of marriage, etc., etc. We're going to provide a detailed layout of Quranic evidence. So we're going to provide the evidence after we provide the full translation of that paragraph. And this way, those of you who are interested in following up on all the Quranic evidence that we provide to justify the correct translation and interpretation that we provide, you can go through all of this evidence. And of course, it will be provided as part of the notes to this segment. And you can have access to the notes by going to this website, www.marvelousquran.org. If you subscribe and you can have access to the notes immediately, inshallah. And finally, as a conclusion, as I said, we're going to have a word about the malignment of Muhammad وسلم, and the negligence of the traditional scholars that we can find throughout the books of Tafsir and by extension, all the translations of the Quran. A few reminders, I'm not going to read them. Just please go through them. This is really important. Don't skip these instructions. If you're not familiar with how we engage the Quran and the types of evidence that we provide from the Quran, then this segment will not make sense to you. Please go back and revisit earlier segments so you can benefit. Especially important is YT93, which you can find on the channel. And inshallah, those of you who have watched it, 
know how significant of a landmark that segment truly is. So we go directly without any delay to Aya 3337, which supposedly talks about Muhammad's marriage to Zainab, his servant Zaid's wife. So in answer to that question, is this ayah talking about such issue? And the answer is absolutely no. No, it's not talking about this issue. It's talking about something totally different. But to set the stage, we have to understand that Muhammad as a Nabi for Bani Israel was engaged in inviting Bani Israel to understand concepts that are brought by Muhammad to them as their Nabi, as their prophet in the tradition of the Torah. And thus he was teaching them and he was bringing them the proper interpretation of various aspects of their religion according to the Torah, of course, until the end of the prophethood. And all along, he was inviting them to follow the new system of the Quran, to move over from the old Torah system where they required prophets and Nabiyun, and to follow the message of the Quran where they can be disciplined in engaging the Quran directly and receive the divine guidance from Allah directly. So that process of teaching them, of meeting with them, of sharing with them his knowledge as a Nabi in the tradition of the Nabiyun of the Torah, that process is what's being discussed in these two ayat that we're going to see, ayat 36 and 37. It has nothing to do with Zayd divorcing his wife Zainab so that Muhammad supposedly can marry her or whether or not Muhammad وسلم, saw Zainab in her night clothes or any of this stuff. None of this salacious stuff is part of this ayah. So let's go through the translation. Some of this will not make sense until you see the evidence. But when you see the evidence throughout the rest of this segment, inshallah, you will understand exactly how we reach the conclusion that this ayah is a very significant ayah. And this is perhaps why it's true interpretation and it's true translation were hid from us. And you will see and judge for yourself. So we start with Ayah 36, as I said, because that's part of the context of Ayah 37. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَارَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ And it is not befitting a believer, be they a man or a woman, when Allah and His Messenger decree a matter to have their independent choice in their affairs regarding that matter, of course. So this is the beginning of Ayah 36 and immediately you notice that the Ayah is talking about a believing man and a believing woman. And this is not necessarily common in the Quran. Sometimes the Quran just talks about the believers in general. Sometimes the Quran talks about a believer, a mu'min, implying man and woman. In this case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was very explicit that he's talking about the believing man and the believing woman and he distinguished between them. Why? Because Ayah 37 is going to build on this concept and continue in the same discourse. So Ayah 37, as we will see, is not split from the rest of the Quran, talking about its own story and not referring to, to any of the contexts within which it's revealed. So let's continue. وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا And whoever disobeys Allah and His Messenger, indeed, he has gone astray in a manifest aberrance. So notice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the believers, a man and a woman. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is providing us the context of Muhammad the Rasul. But then later, as we will see, the next part of this paragraph is going to distinguish between Muhammad the Rasul up here and Muhammad the Nabi. And the Nabi has different responsibilities and different obligations. So we start with Ayah 37. وَإِذْ تَقُولُ لِلَّذِي أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَأَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهُ So therefore here pay attention that this ayah in here, ayah 36, clearly told us that a believer man or a believer woman don't have the choice after Allah and the Messenger Muhammad decree something and they don't have a choice to conduct their own affairs differently than that decree. And it's clearly telling us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not appreciate those who disobey Allah and His Messenger. And, and, wa, if, and when. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that those who disobey Allah and His Messenger have gone astray in a manifest aberrance. But it continues in the next ayah. Wa if, 
wa is. So this wa and is a continuation of the prior ayah. And neither did they have an independent choice when she, the believing woman mentioned above, says to the man upon whom Allah provided favors and upon whom you provided favors. Wa is taqulu. Taqulu, she says, this is not addressing Muhammad. This is not telling Muhammad that you said. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us a specific instance that took place that violates what is being taught in ayah 36 up here. So this is the meaning of this letter, wow. It's a continuation of the prior ayah. It is not a separate ayah standing on its own. So it's provided as an example. If, when she says, to the man upon whom Allah provided favors and upon whom you provided favors. An'am Allahu alayhi wa an'amta alayhi. So before we go any further, why do we say taqulu is she? I'm going to jump to the notes and then I'm going to come back and continue the translation of this ayah. And we're going to take it very slow, very carefully so you understand the exact meaning of this ayah and that it has nothing to do with the servant Zayd or his wife Zainab or about marriage at all. So we go down below to the first note. And if you remember that we have made distinctions in the past between a verb in the third person feminine camouflaging as the second person masculine. When did we see this? Well, we saw this in segment YT89 in the story of Isa ibn Maryam, part of that series. And we said about ayah 5, 110 from Surah Al-Ma'idah. وَإِذْ تَخْلُقُوا مِنَ الطِّينِ كَهَيْئَةِ الطَّيْرِ بِإِذْنِي فَتَنْفُخُ فِيهَا فَتَكُونُ طَيْرًا بِإِذْنِي All of the translations and the interpretations took this verb, تَخْلُقُوا, as if this is Allah addressing Isa, meaning the second person. And instead, as we did the tafsil, we found that it's not Allah talking to Isa, it's Allah talking about another thing, which is the tayr, and we explained this in YT89. So therefore, it's a third person, in this case, third person plural, which usually is conjugated as a feminine third person. So when they, the tayr, created from teen, meaning from Maryam, similarly to what was prepared by the tayr, i.e. by the angels, by my permission, etc., etc. We saw this third person, in this case, plural feminine, camouflaging as a second person masculine. Why? Because in the morphology of Arabic, they are exactly the same. And it's only the context that allows you to distinguish between one and the next. We saw another example also in the series about Isa and Maryam in YT84, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us about the story of Zakariya. قَالَ رَبِّ جعل لي آية قال آيتك ألا all the books of translations and tafsir interpreted this verb to kalima as if Allah is talking to Zakaria, second person. But we have proven, again in this segment, YT84, you can refer to it. He said, my Lord, designate for me a sign. Designate for me a sign that she is in agreement, that Maryam is in agreement. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, your sign is that she will remain silent. She will remain silent. She to kalima. Third person feminine. Again, the same thing in Surah Ali Imran. Again, from the same segment, YT84. Allah to kalima. She does not speak for three days. She will remain silent for three days as a sign to you that she approves, that she agrees. And therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this type of ambiguity to camouflage some concepts. Camouflage some concepts, yes, to conceal some concepts from those who want to rush in their interpretation. This is exactly what happened in this ayah. وَإِذْ تَقُولُ تَقُولُ is not you saying it, it is she, the believing woman, who is mentioned right here in the same color. I put them in the same color, and we're going to see it down below also in the same color. So this is the same woman up here, مُؤْمِنَةٍ meaning a believing woman, when she says, to the man upon whom Allah provided favors and upon whom you provided favors. Meaning this is a man from Bani Israel. He has received favors before through various prophets who came to Bani Israel before. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, also a Nabi to Bani Israel, providing favors. 
Anama, Anama, this is part of the locution of Bani Israel. And we have seen it before, and we read it every day in the Fatiha. And we see it in so many different places in the Quran. Whenever we say Na'ma or An'am even, all of these words relate to the same concept, which is for Allah to provide favors upon them. And this is proof that Muhammad also provided favors in the same style, the style of Bani Israel, meaning he was a prophet, a Nabi from Bani Israel to Bani Israel. Of course, again, he was a Rasul to us and we accept him as a Rasul who brought us the Quran for us to follow directly and to engage directly. So this is the first note. Let's continue. This woman is saying to the man, to someone from Bani Israel, أمسك عليك زوجك واتق الله وتخفي في نفسك ما الله مبديه وتخشى الناس والله أحق أن تخشاه. She is talking to one of Bani Israel, a man from Bani Israel. Has nothing to do with Muhammad. These things are not addressed by Allah to Muhammad. So she says, hold on to your counterpart as an authority over you. Who is your counterpart? It is Muhammad. And we're going to see the definition of zawj and azwaj and how it fits into all of the locution that we are discussing. So hold on to your counterpart, Muhammad, as an authority over you and be disciplined towards the words of Allah. In other words, study the Quran with him. How do we know this? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that the issue involves convincing Bani Israel to shift to the system of Rasul, the system brought by Muhammad as a Rasul, as a messenger. In other words, the Quran and to depart from the system of the Torah. We've explained this in so many different segments already in the last six months. So she's telling him, stick to your counterpart, meaning Muhammad as an authority over you and be disciplined towards the word of Allah. And she's telling him, you are currently unless you do that, you are hiding within yourself that which Allah is inevitably exposing. In other words, she was a true believer. She was a true believer and telling this man from Bani Israel, don't play games with this. If you truly believe in Muhammad, stick with Muhammad. And don't hide the fact that you believe in Muhammad because you are afraid of people. As she continues, because you fear people, while Allah is more deserving that you fear him. So this is a woman up here, defined right here, clearly talking to another supposed believer who is tempted to hide his convictions regarding Muhammad the Messenger. And she's telling him, don't hide these convictions. Make sure you follow Muhammad as a messenger. He came to us as a Nabi and he's telling us we should also follow him as a messenger of the Quran and thus we should engage Wattaqillah, we should engage and be disciplined in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of these meanings we've talked about before, now when we're putting them in this ayah and applying all of these concepts, all of a sudden this ayah illuminates and it becomes bright and significantly different than what they taught us. The really terrible implications of what they taught us, we will discuss in just a few minutes in the remainder of this segment, inshallah. But I wanted to first give you the true understanding of this ayah. This is not Muhammad talking to Zayd. This is a woman talking to one of the men of Bani Israel, telling him, keep your counterpart as an authority over you. Keep Muhammad as an authority over you. As you see in here, the three lines in blue are related to that woman. Now we continue. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the rest of the story. Which story? The story that, that it is not befitting for a believer, man or woman, to disobey Allah and his messenger. This is the story. So we continue. فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِنْهَا وَطَرًا زَوَّجْنَاكَهَا And I broke them up like this because I want to show you exactly how to do tafseel. فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ When so and so died. Zaydun in here is not the proper name of a man, is not a proper name of a servant of Muhammad. The Arabs use the word Zayd just like they use the word Fulan, which is mentioned in the Quran. Just like the Quran also uses Adam to replace the real name of a prophet or a Nabi or a messenger with a generic Adam. And sometimes the Quran says this man or that man, the one who died for a hundred years, 
We're not given his name. So this is a way to make the story generic, not being specific to a specific man. In this case, Zayd is not the servant of Muhammad. Let's go to the note below and we will see exactly where the Quran uses such technique. So Zayd is not the proper name of Muhammad's servant as they told us. Let's look at this ayah from Surah Al-Furqan 25, ayah 28. وَيَوْمَ يَعَضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِ اتَّخَذْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا يَا وَيْلَتَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَتَّخِذْ فُلَانًا خَلِيلًا And at the time when the transgressor shall bite his hands in regret, saying, I wish I had taken away to the truth. Oh, woe to me, I wish I did not take so and so, fulanan, as a throughway, a conveyor or a conduit. So does fulanan refer to a specific person? No, it's a generic X. It's an indication of someone being discussed. Fulanan. So the Quran uses this technique. So Zaid is something also the Arabs used. Zaid referring to a generic person. Zaidun min an nas This person or that person. And by the way, this claim that Zaid is a generic reference to a human being, a man, is not just my idea. Some scholars in our tradition actually said this. So this is not new, but we're applying this concept and broadening it using the concept of tafsil and using everything we learned about Muhammad as an Abi to Bani Israel and fitting it over this ayah. And all of a sudden, this ayah makes sense. Ayah 37. So we continue. فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ When so and so died. Who is this so and so? Well, he is the believer up here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us an example of him and he's giving us specific details about what happened with him. Minha wataran zawajnakaha. I broke this sentence up. So it's not qada minha wataran. It's falamma qada zaydun when so and so died. Upon her request, minha, as a benefit to her, wataran, we allowed you to become a counterpart for her. Zawajnakaha. Notice that there is historon. Protron in here, taqdeem wa ta'khir, meaning it should be zawajnakaha wataran minha. So it should be this word first, and then this word next, and then this word next. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala switched the order in the Quran because Allah is teaching us something very important using the eloquence technique of taqdeem and ta'khir. So what is the benefit of this? The benefit is as a result of her request, upon her request, as a benefit to her, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the permission to Muhammad to become a counterpart, not a husband. Zawajnakaha is not talking about marriage. That's a different word. The word for marriage in the Quran is nikah. This is zawajnakaha. It means to make you a counterpart. What does that mean counterpart? We saw in here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the same word, zawjaka, the one who is bringing you information or teaching you or a counterpart to you. And we're going to see more detail, inshallah, in the evidence that we present in the remainder of this segment. So, minha wataran, upon her request, as a benefit to her, we allowed you to become a counterpart for her, meaning a conduit of information to her and her being from among Bani Israel. So, what's going on in here? What's going on in here is Muhammad, as a Nabi to Bani Israel, as a Prophet to Bani Israel, was meeting with various people from the tribes of Bani Israel who lived around Medina. And he was meeting with them and providing information to them. And through them, and through them, they were providing information to additional people. So that created a problem. When one of those intermediary through ways, so to speak, died, what happens to the rest of the chain, to the rest of the people who were receiving information from Muhammad through that person in the middle, through that person who is Zaid in this case, Zaid, various people. So what happens when Zaid in the middle dies? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the other recipients, the other recipients, even if they were females, were allowed to come directly to Muhammad and request that Muhammad talks to them directly. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving Muhammad permission to do this. Why? Because there's a chain of transmission as a Nabi that Muhammad was observing to make sure that the information that he provided as a Nabi does not get corrupted in the transmission. So when a person who is part of this chain dies, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him, 
the others can come requesting that you connect with them directly. Well, why is that so important? Because the others who were connected to Muhammad via via Zaid would not know about this unless Zaid was really teaching them the proper things. So therefore, how would Muhammad know to pick up where Zaid left off, so to speak? The answer is, the others will come asking you. Minha wataran. Upon her request, as a benefit to her and her peers and the others in that group, so to speak, we allowed you to become a direct counterpart for her, even if she was a woman, even if she was a woman. This is why the ayah is in the feminine. So Minha, the exact same woman who was saying this in here, is the same woman believer that's mentioned in here. So it makes perfect sense. There is no problem with this ayah, has nothing to do with marriage. So we continue with the ayah and you will see for yourself. لِكَيْ لَا يَكُونَ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ حَرَجٌ فِي أَزْوَاجِ أَدْعِيَائِهِمْ إِذَا قَضَوْا So that there is no blame upon the believers regarding the counterparts of those whom they were inviting to Islam, meaning to the way of the Qur'an, when they die. Of course, the exact same issue applies to the other believers because just like Muhammad was carrying new information to Bani Israel, Muhammad وسلم, had close companions who were also sent as emissaries by Muhammad to various tribes and various congregations. And thus, if one of those people who is in a throughway, so to speak, for the emissaries dies, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving that person the permission to meet with his successors, with people who come after him, as long as they come to you first. They come asking. In other words, they know that this person was getting this information from the emissary, the mu'mineen, the companions, close companions of Muhammad, and thus the close companions were also allowed to follow the same process. So you ask, why is this such an involved process? The answer is because some of this information was not shared with the masses. This is exactly what we have been saying for a long time on this channel, that the close companions and those taught by the close companions had information that was privileged, that was part of the jannat, and therefore it's not to be shared in public randomly in lectures and so on and so forth. So this is exactly what we've been saying. So here the same concept, the mu'mineen, if the person's being invited to follow the way of Muhammad, the messenger, if that person dies, then their counterparts, other people he was teaching or she was teaching, would come, would come minhunna wataran as a request from them, as a benefit to them, they come requesting to become the counterpart instead of the one who died. I hope it's really clear. It's very simple, it's very elegant concept, and it's based on the understanding that Muhammad وسلم, and his close companions shared specific privileged information with a few people, and those few people would be allowed to share it with their counterparts, other people like them, and so on and so forth. So if someone in the chain dies, this is a process to replace that person who died. This is all that this ayah is talking about has nothing to do with a servant called Zaid or his wife who was called Zainab or whether or not Muhammad وسلم, went visiting Zaid at his house and saw, snuck a peek so to speak with Zainab scantily dressed or any of this stuff, ugly stuff that is mentioned in the books of Tafsir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not send us a book that's for all times and places and people so that he talks about an incident, supposedly, where Muhammad saw a woman scantily dressed. This is silly. This is a mentality that goes back to the smallness of the minds of those who want to interpret the Qur'an in that smallness of their minds. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us and teaching the companions of Muhammad وسلم, and Muhammad at the time how to promote, how to propagate the knowledge about the prophethood that Muhammad وسلم, was given, especially to Bani Israel. So the end of this ayah, وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ مَفْعُولًا This is the interpretation of this ayah. Now we continue to prove that the next couple of ayah confirm exactly what we just said. So we go to ayah 33, 38 through 40 from Surah Al-Ahzab again, which is the next three ayah that follow ayah 37 that we just discussed. The context is clearly talking about Muhammad 
the Nabi for Bani Israel. You just read it and you decide for yourself and you'll understand exactly what the issue is all about. Once you understand the concept that Muhammad is a Nabi for Bani Israel and he was inviting them to leave the system of the Torah and to come into the system of the Quran, these ayat become no-brainers, very easy to understand. So let's read these ayat and see the translations and you'll decide for yourself if what we said makes sense or not. So the next ayah, ayah 38 says, ما كان على النبي من حرج فيما فرض الله له سنة الله في الذين خلوا من قبل وكان أمر الله قدرا مقدورا There is no blame upon the Prophet regarding what Allah has imposed upon him or for him both are applicable in this case as a ruling by Allah regarding those who have passed on before في الذين خلوا من قبل those who passed on before Muhammad and Allah's command has already been decreed in a measured manner. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him, we have imposed this matter upon you and we're going to give you ways so that there is no blame upon you in how you act and how you deliver that mission, mission of Nabi, clearly talking about Nabi. Whereas at the beginning, it is a messenger, Rasul. So therefore, it's talking about this transition between Rasul and Nabi. This is exactly what we've explained before in prior segments. Now we continue. الَّذِينَ يُبَلِّغُونَ رِسَالَاتِ اللَّهِ وَيَخْشَوْنَهُ وَلَا يَخْشَوْنَ أَحَدًا إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ حَسِيبًا The above ruling mentioned in Ayah 33-38, meaning this Ayah right here, applies to those who deliver the messages of Allah and are mindful of Him and are not fearful of anyone except Allah. And they reckon that Allah alone suffices as a judge for them. Now I want you to pay attention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising a group of people who deliver the messages, messages, and they fear only Allah and they don't fear anyone else. Now, if we go back to that ayah, ayah 33, 37, and we go all the way up there, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using very harsh language, supposedly, as they told us, to talk about Muhammad? Of course not, because the very next couple of ayat are saying Muhammad is like those who came before him. And yet this ayah is clearly saying, nas, wallahu ahaqqu an You fear people while Allah is more deserving that you fear him. Was that supposed to talk about Muhammad, you think? Or was that talking about this man in here who is disobeying Allah and his messenger? Obviously, it's the latter. It's not the prior one. So we go back to ayah 39 now. الَّذِينَ يُبَلِّغُونَ رِسَالَةِ اللَّهِ وَيَخْشَوْنَهُ وَلَا يَخْشَوْنَ أَحَدًا إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ حَسِيبًا They deliver the messages of Allah and are mindful of Him, afraid of Him, so to speak, not fearful of anyone else except Allah, including Muhammad, which proves that ayah 37 is not talking about Muhammad being afraid of people and not being afraid of Allah. Astaghfirullah. We're going to come back to this issue at the end of this segment as a conclusion, and you'll see how significant is what we're saying regarding this ayah. So in the next ayah, ayah 40, is a beautiful wrap for everything we've said so far. مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمًا We've talked about this many times. Muhammad was never sent to you to be the forefather, not the biological father. This ayah is not talking about the biological ability of Muhammad to father sons and males as they explained to us. No, it's talking about Muhammad being the forefather in the style of the forefathers of the people of the Torah, so to speak. He's not the forefather for any of us readers of the Quran, but a messenger of Allah to us and the seal of prophets, meaning the expiration of prophethood, to them, of course, as we explained. And Allah has always been the exposer of evidence-based knowledge about all parts of the scripture. So as you see, ayah 36 and 37, which we covered above, and ayah 38, 39, 40, fit beautifully to give us a very clean and elegant understanding and a very practical instruction to Muhammad and the close companions around him as they dealt with the issue of providing information to Bani Israel, inviting Bani Israel to come to follow the Quranic system. So as you see, Ayah 33-37 and the one before it, Ayah 33-36, have nothing to do with Zayd or his wife Zainab and whether or not Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married her, maybe or maybe not, 
We don't care. This ayah has nothing to do with those events. We have demonstrated again and again that the Quran is not connected directly to what's called asbab nuzul the causes of revelation. This Quran is for all times and places and all people. It has nothing to do with the seeming reason. So to them, it seemed that the Quran was talking about that issue. We don't care what it seemed to them. What we care about is what is really the Quran talking about. And as we've demonstrated, these ayat have nothing to do with what they claimed. So now let's look at some of the evidence so that you see that our interpretation and translation are not baseless. They're not just an opinion, but they're built on direct knowledge from the Quran. So let's take the first issue that we covered already. Taqulu is a third person feminine. It is not a second person masculine as they thought in their own interpretation. And these three sentences are not being said by Allah against Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that this is what this woman, this woman, this believing woman said to her counterpart, meaning the conduit, the person who was bringing information from Muhammad the Nabi to her. Now, the next part, فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ We said, so and so died. Zaydun, Zaydun, as we showed a little earlier, refers to a person, a generic person, so and so, like Fulan, meaning so and so. And this is confirmed by many observations. Zaid is a placeholder, as we said, for an unnamed person like Fulan. He's not the supposed adopted son of Muhammad Sallallahu nor would the Quran talk about such a thing. In fact, no other companion was named in the Quran. Muhammad's own children and wives were not named in the Quran. Many of the prophets and messengers were not named in the Quran. So the Quran is not about naming specific individuals as they told us. Zaid was the only companion who was mentioned in the Quran. No, that's not true. It is inconsistent with the rest of the Quran if you make that claim. And finally, as we have seen with the term Adam, Adam is also a generic name for an unnamed prophet or messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a generic reference to obscure the identity of the one mentioned. Because what matters is not the name or the specific identity. What matters is the generic case that the Quran is presenting. That's why the Quran uses a lot of relative pronouns and relative names and etc. etc to teach us the lesson, to teach us the essence of the issue, not to make a specific example of one specific person. So clearly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not talking about Zaid, the supposed servant of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now we look at the verb qada, qada, we translated it as died. He simply died. He's no longer part of the chain of transmission that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his close companions were using to deliver the information to the right people within Bani Israel. As you can imagine, Muhammad and the close companions were not allowed to just go and make public speeches among Bani Israel. There was a threat, there was a risk for them doing that. So the only way they had is to use such chain of transmissions, meaning from one person to another person, maybe in families, maybe in small groups, etc., etc. So qada is used in the Quran to mean the termination or the end of such a person. Let's look at some examples. Again, down below in here, qada or a derivative of the verb qada, al-qadiya, is used in ayah 6927. This person who receives his record, so to speak, through the wrong understanding, he would make a supplication, Ya laytaha kanat al qadiya I wish my death was the termination of me, meaning I wouldn't be resurrected, I wouldn't be brought back to face the consequences. This ayah 46, 29, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا قُضِيَ When it was finished, we've provided the translation of this as part of YT 74, YT 75, and YT 76. You can refer back to those segments. And here, لِيَقْضِ عَلَيْنَا رَبُّكَ This is from Ayah 4377. Those occupants of Nar are calling out, we wish that Allah would terminate our existence instead of continuing it and allowing the punishment to continue. Here clearly, قَضَى عَلَيْهَا الْمَوْتِ Death terminated it. And here, لَا يُقْضَى عَلَيْهِمْ فَيَمُوتُونَ 
they're not terminated and thus they don't die. So the concept of qada is associated very closely with death or termination in general. So that's why we say up there in ayah 33-37 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ When he died مِنْهَا وَطَرًا زَوَّجْنَاكَهَا Upon her request as a benefit to her وَطَرًا Where did we get this? Well, if you go to the dictionaries and again we go down below in the notes and I'm sorry I keep going up and down but I want to show you that everything is documented in this notes file and you can really take it and really learn and analyze it for yourself and verify. So here from the dictionary called Lisan Al-Arab right here we have وَطَر وَطَر كُلُّ حَاجَةٍ كَانَ لِصَاحِبِهَا فِيهَا هِمَّا Every intended matter in which the person who needs such matter puts an effort. So therefore up in Ayah 37 those who are receiving the knowledge through the person in the middle, the through way, Zaid, if Zaid is no longer in if Zaid is no longer in the picture, is terminated, gone, the others can come requesting. So by them coming to Muhammad to request more knowledge, Muhammad would know that this Zaid, who is no longer in the picture, Zaid was teaching those others. And this is how the chain would be repaired, so to speak, if one of the nodes in the chain disappears. This is what the concept is all about. So if we go back up to 33:37, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is providing such process of repairing the broken chain of transmission for other believers, other mu'mineen who were close companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa who were also acting as emissaries teaching others. Do we know from history, so-called history in our tradition that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sent such emissaries to various groups and various clans? The answer is absolutely yes. So those of you who know the so-called Islamic tradition and Islamic seerah and Islamic history cannot deny what I'm saying. This is part of how Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa learned how to do this. So Zawaj Nakaha refers to Zawaj and they told us we allowed you to marry her or we requested you to marry her as some books of Tafsir said Muhammad knew that he was supposed to marry this so-called Zainab. Well let's look at the word Zawaj Nakaha. The word in the Quran for marriage is Nikah not Zawaj. Zawaj is a different concept. Let's look at some evidence down below again in the references when we look at the word Azwaj and Zawj. As we learned from Surah Yaseen and Surah Ashura, we have the following two ayat. Subhana alladhi khalaqa al-azwaj kullaha. The way of he who created all pairs or all counterparts. Kullaha, all of them from three categories. What are the three categories? What the scripture produces, meaning the evidence and the type of knowledge that you extract from the scripture, it usually comes in twos, in pairs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us some methodological instruction. What else? Women and fusihim, and from themselves, right here, meaning people like them. So you can talk about azwaj regarding people who are like you or like the person or the character being described in one or more ayat. What else? And from them, the prior communities of faith who have no evidence based knowledge. From those who do not have evidence based knowledge, meaning the other communities of faith or the prior communities of faith, Bani Israel included. And this is exactly what we said. So when the believing woman told her counterpart over there in Ayah 33 37, it is using this reference from people who do not have evidence-based knowledge, referring to Muhammad as one of their counterparts. This is the same concept exactly being laid out in Surah Yasin. Now also in Surah Al-Hijr, Do not go looking, seeking information at what we have given as a delay to some counterparts or pairs among them, meaning the, the disbelievers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching Muhammad, don't look for evidence or knowledge coming from their side to bring from their side, from the side of the other counterparts, etc. for the rest of the ayah. So azwaj is used in this way in the Quran in many, many different places. As a matter of fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that there are three cases where azwaj is used. One of them is min anfusihim, people like you. 
Another one is from those who don't have evidence-based knowledge. And the third one referring to evidence coming out from the Quran, what gets produced as a result of your toiling on the scripture. So what about the verb zawajnakaha, which occurs in that ayah, ayah 37 above? The Quran uses this verb, but it's not referring to the type of marriage that you think of. كَذَلِكَ وَزَوَّجْنَاهُمْ بِحُورٍ عِينٍ We caused them to be matched or paired with Hur, those ayat that are unraveled and that are good sources of knowledge. وَزَوَّجْنَاهُمْ بِحُورٍ عِينٍ This is the same thing in this ayah. So you're going to ask what about ayah 50 from Surah Ash-Shura. أَوْ يُزَوِّجُهُمْ ذُكْرَانًا وَإِنَاثًا And I'll tell you, ذُكْرَانًا does not mean what you think it means. And the proof is right here. Because the ayah right before it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَهَبُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ إِنَاثًا He grants whomever he wills, إِنَاثْ feminine, feminine. وَيَهَبُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ الذُّكُورِ The masculine. So الذُّكُورِ الْإِنَاثْ refer to masculine and feminine. Dhukranan is a different word. This is not dhukur. It's not talking about men and women. This is talking about something else and we will get to this in a future segment inshallah when we discuss future stories in the Quran and this will become very obvious. It has nothing to do with the marriage as we think about it. The Quran consistently uses a different verb for marriage. As a matter of fact, in the same surah, Surah Al-Ahzab, Ayah 50, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَمْرَأَةً مُؤْمِنَةً إِنْ وَهَبَتْ نَفْسَهَا لِلنَّبِيِّ إِنْ أَرَادَ النَّبِيُّ أَنْ يَسْتَنْكِحَهَا خَالِصَةً لَكَ مِنْ دُونِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And a believing woman, if she grants herself to the Prophet, if the Prophet seeks to wed her, wed her, to marry her, an exclusive option for you as an intermediary between her, this woman, and the believers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a Nabi, Muhammad, a Nabi, not as a messenger, a Nabi, not as a follower of the Quran, as a Nabi for Bani Israel. He had that option. If a woman comes to him, not only seeking to become a Zawj, but becomes a wife, yes, the Nabi had the option to accept that. Whether or not he did, we really don't know because we're looking at history or the events in history across 1400 years of lenses that have been muddied and books that were corrupted in how they told us and reported to us the stories of such events. So therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word yastankihaha in the same surah referring to marriage. So zawajnakaha has nothing to do with marriage. And therefore by definition those who understand the Quran, understand the terminology of the Quran cannot possibly think that ayah 37 is supposedly talking about Zainab and Muhammad's marriage to Zainab, etc., etc. So we go back to this ayah, ayah 37 again. لِكَيْ لَا يَكُونَ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ حَرَجٌ فِي أَزْوَاجِ أَدْعِيَائِهِمْ إِذَا قَضَوْا So that there is no blame upon the believers regarding the counterparts of those whom they were inviting to Islam, أَدْعِيَائِهِمْ Inviting to the way of the Qur'an when they die. When they die, إِذَا قَضَوْا We have seen this. So what about the word أَدْعِيَائِهِمْ Well, let's go down and see again in the notes and you'll see for yourself. أَدْعِيَائِهِمْ has nothing to do with supposedly their sons they named after them. As if all of the companions in Medina were taking on sons and daughters and adopting them, so to speak. No, it's not true. This is a unique word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used in the Qur'an. So I will leave this word until a few minutes later because we're going to discuss the opening paragraph of Surah Al-Ahzab where this word is really used and we're going to analyze this word and you're going to see for yourself that it fits beautifully in the way we translated it. Those whom they were inviting to the way of the Quran, to Islam so to speak. We're going to see in more details. So now that we've finished discussing Ayah 37 in full detail, explaining exactly what it's all about, now we're going to apply this knowledge to the opening paragraph of Surah Al-Ahzab and you'll see exactly that it fits beautifully in that opening paragraph. Again, they messed up the translation and interpretation of that opening paragraph and we're going to provide a much better interpretation inshallah and much better translation. So this is the first ayah from Surah Al-Ahzab. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِيِّ اتَّقِ اللَّهَ وَلَا تُطِعِ الْكَافِرِينَ وَالْمُنَافِقِينَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلِيمًا حَكِيمًا O Prophet, Nabi, he's talking about Muhammad, the Nabi, not the Messenger. Be disciplined in engaging the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What kind of instruction is this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching him 
Focus on interpreting the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a disciplined manner. Of course, as a Nabi, he was required to do this. As a Rasul, he would never tell him to do this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never tell the Rasul, ittaqillah. But as a Nabi, he would tell him, ittaqillah, be disciplined in engaging the words of the scripture. And do not enable the rejectors and the hypocrites. وَلَا تُطِعَ الْكَافِرِينَ وَالْمُنَافِقِينَ Don't obey them? Well, no. Don't enable them. Don't allow them to carry out their plans and their schemes. And then the ayah continues, Indeed, Allah has always been to you a provider of evidence-based knowledge about them and proper discernment about the scripture. So the signature of this ayah fits perfectly in what we just said. واتبع ما يوحى إليك من ربك And follow that which has been enjoined, instructed to you from your Lord. Indeed, Allah has always been a provider of reports based exclusively on what you, in the plural, toil on the scripture. إن الله كان بما تعملون خبيرا Now I'm talking about the opening paragraph from Surah 33, Al-Ahzab. But I want to stop for something very significant about this ayah, ayah number two. If you read all the interpretations and the translations, you find that they are patently wrong. So for example, Sahih International translate this ayah by saying, indeed Allah is ever with what you do, acquainted. Acquainted with what you do meaning. And clearly this is wrong. This is not what the ayah is saying. It's saying, bima ta'maluna khabiran. Notice that there is histron, protron, taqdeem wa ta'khir. So the normal sentence, the normal way of expressing this information would have been khabiran bima ta'malun. Khabiran bima ta'malun. This moved like that. Khabiran bima ta'malun. But this is not what the ayah says. The ayah says bima ta'maluna khabiran. And we translated it based exclusively on what you toil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides the reports, the information, the knowledge about what they've done based exclusively on what you toil in the scripture. But the various translations twist the importance of the histron, proteron, and dismiss it. So what they say is, Allah is acquainted with what you do. Pikthal says, Allah is aware of what you do. Yusuf Ali says, Allah is well acquainted with what you do. Abdul Halim, which is the Oxford translation, which in my opinion, I keep saying, is the worst translation out there. Allah is well aware of all your actions. Muhammad Asad, God is truly aware of all that you do. Sayyid Hussein Nasr, who is supported by various so-called scholars from various Islamic studies department, says God is aware of whatever you do. And then finally, A.J. Arbery, God is aware of the things you do. So the problem with all these translations is that they totally ignored the histeron, proteron that is clearly in this ayah, in this sentence. So what does that mean? Well, it means that they have changed the meaning. And by changing the meaning, if you apply the histeron, proteron, it says Allah only knows that which you do, as they said in here. But they switched it. But if you really apply the histeron, proteron, and change what they have just said, it becomes borderline kufr. Allah only knows that which they do. Of course, this is not what the intention for this ayah is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us, in accordance with how you toil, you may extract certain knowledge and certain information from the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using the word khabir as an active participle. He's teaching you, he's providing you acquaintance. He's allowing you to become aware exclusively based on the way you do your toiling on the scripture. So we continue with the next ayat, ayah 3 to 4. وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا And refer to Allah as the exclusive linguistic arbiter or arbitrator for interpreting the scripture. وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا And sufficient is Allah as an arbiter. وَكِيلًا And we talked about wakil when we discussed the story of Yusuf, the whole series about the surah Yusuf. And we talked about the true meaning of the verb wakil, which is arbiter, meaning the one who makes judgments regarding the linguistic understanding of various contracts and agreements and the scripture itself. Let's continue with the next ayah. مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِّنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ Allah did not render any guidance for a man with two cores inside of him. وَمَا جَعَلَ أَزْوَاجَكُمُ اللَّائِي تُظَاهِرُونَ مِنْهُنَّ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ and he did not vest your counterparts from among them, from among them, with whom you collude, exposing information about the community of believers, 
to be like your mothers, to be like your mothers, ummahatukum. This is a clear, significant departure for how all the books of translation and all of the books of tafsir have dealt with this ayah. And we're going to explain in just a few minutes the significance of the mistake they have made by misunderstanding this ayah. But we continue and then we will come back to more notes. وَمَا جَعَلَ أَدْعِيَاءَكُمْ أَبْنَاءَكُمْ And he, Allah, did not vest those whom you claim to be inviting to Islam to be like your son. أَدْعِيَاءَكُمْ Those whom you claim to be inviting to Islam. ذَلِكُمْ قَوْلُكُمْ بِأَفْوَاهِكُمْ Those are claims you made with your own mouths. وَاللَّهُ يَقُولُ الْحَقِّ And Allah, not the rejecters or hypocrites, declares the truth. وَهُوَ يَهْدِي السَّبِيلِ And he alone guides to the right way. So what is this ayah talking about? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that people should not have two cores, meaning conflicting or confused priorities within them. Either you are part of the community of believers or you are part of the community of the non-believers or those who believed in the past, you're inviting them to the way of the Quran and they are part of your invitees. Ad'iyaikum, ad'iyaikum in here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them, those ad'iya, those whom you claim to be inviting to, you, to Islam, are not like your sons. Don't treat them like your sons. Using this word, abna'akum, as if they are your sons, is not acceptable to Allah. Why is that so important? Because this surah, as we saw up here, up above, is talking about the hypocrites and the rejecters. So what's going on with this ayah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that there are some people who claim to be meeting with Bani Israel, inviting them to the new way, to the Quran, inviting them, ad'iya'akum, and they're calling them, they're like our sons, where in reality, they are colluding with them against the community of believers. Allah did not vest those counterparts with whom you are meeting from among them, with whom you collude, tudahiruna minhunna, they are not like your mothers, meaning they're not like the source of information for you. So don't treat them as a source of information. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is providing a warning to Muhammad and a warning to some of those companions that some among the companions were doing this and were colluding with them. Why do I say colluding with them? Because that's exactly what this word means. And I'm going to show you with your own eyes how the Quran proves this to us. Exactly in the same surah even, surah 33. But before I show you the evidence for tulahiruna minhunna, I want to continue the next ayah. Invite them to their Abrahamic forefathers or the Torah type of forefathers. What does that mean? Invite them to their forefathers. Invite them to the forefathers who told them that Muhammad would be the last prophet, Nabi, for them and they would have to switch based on what the message, what the scripture brought with Muhammad as a Rasul. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching the companions to invite Bani Israel to what their own forefathers taught. And then Allah continues, huwa aqsatu Allah. This is more aligned with Allah's accurate measure. And then comes this next sentence, which is really stunning. فَإِن لَمْ تَعْلَمُوا آبَاءَهُمْ If you have no evidence-based knowledge regarding the forefathers they follow, regarding the forefathers they follow, not the right forefathers, not Yaqub and Yusuf, etc., etc., but the other rabbis and teachers who corrupted some of the scripture and who corrupted some of the interpretation, as we have seen many times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, if you don't know who those forefathers are, meaning you have no evidence-based knowledge that the forefathers they follow are the right ones, then let them be as a group among your brethren in obligations or your subservient minions. فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ وَمَوَالِيكُمْ What does that mean? That means there will come a time where you give them the choice either to become like you, brothers, in the same way of following the Qur'an, or if they refuse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving an advanced warning to people of Bani Israel that their own laws will be applicable to them and they will become subservient minions, meaning they will be taken as captives. I think it's really clear what I'm saying. And this is the way the Quran spoke to Muhammad and the close companions. 
And then the ayah continues وَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ فِيمَا أَخْطَأْتُمْ بِهِ وَلَكِمْ مَا تَعَمَّدَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ And there's no blame against you regarding mistakes you make in this regard. But there is blame against you regarding what your cause purposefully intended. Remember the prior ayah is telling us about a man or people who have two different cores, meaning they have conflicting interests or confused interests at least, different priorities at the same time, or what we call ulterior motives. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, if you are doing some things by accident or by mistake, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not put the blame on you. But if you are doing it intentionally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put the blame on you. And in any case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghafooran, allows you to establish a connection with him again, and merciful, rahiman. So if you choose repentance and to stop what you're doing in terms of these ulterior motives and colluding with the hypocrites and the rejectors, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept your return and your coming back. So here we have several problems in the traditional translation. The first one is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using this word, ad'iya'akum, and we said it means those you claim to be inviting to the Quran or to Islam. Where did we get this? Let's look at the notes down below. Here we have the word ad'iya with the linguistic analysis. It is like aghniya, it's like anbiya, it's like awliya. All of those are Quranic words. Aghniya comes from ghani, anbiya comes from nabi, awliya comes from wali, ad'iya comes from da'i. Now if we do the morphological analysis, it is used only two times in Surah 33 and the rest of the Quran. Based on the morpheme fa'il, it is based on fa'il. Fa'il possibly means a passive participle, ism maf'ul, meaning the one who is invited from da'awa, from da'awa, the root da'awa, which is used 215 times, clearly meaning to invite or to summon or to supplicate, to ask someone to come this way, to come with you or to supplicate, to make dua, also meaning to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to invite Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into your heart. So the meaning is very clear, it's used 215 times, never once, never once in the Quran, it's used to mean to give a name to someone, or to label someone. And yet, all the books of translation used ad'iya in these ayat, these two times in surah 33, and they translated them as, those you name as your sons. So they refer to ad'iya based on the root of da'wa means to call or to name someone. And yet it's never used this way in the rest of the Quran. 215 times consistently used as one of these three meanings, not to provide a name to someone. So clearly this ayah in here, وَمَا جَعَلَ أَدْعِيَاءَكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not talking about those you claim to be your sons, meaning your adopted sons. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not talking about adoption in this ayah. So this is why we said in the next ayah, اِدْعُوهُمْ Invite them, invite them. Not name them, not call them a name. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never used this word da'a or da'awa to mean assign a label or assign a name to someone. So here are some examples. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ تَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ عِبَادٌ أَمْثَالُكُمْ فَادْعُوهُمْ those you call upon as intermediaries between you and Allah are wayfarers like you. Summon them. Id'uhum. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لَكُمْ Therefore, let them dignify your summon if you are truthful. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Id'uhum does not mean to give them a name, to assign them a name. Of course, summon them, bring them over, or supplicate to them. Here's another ayah. وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَادْعُوهُ Biha. To Allah belongs the labels with insight and thus use them to make your supplications. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not saying call him with those names or, or assign such a name to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying make supplication to Allah using these beautiful insightful labels given to us in the Quran. As a matter of fact this word asma is the standard label that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses to refer to labeling something or someone or to give or assign a name to something or someone. Samma, yusammi, isman, tasmiya. And here are a bunch of examples. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in Surah Al-Hajj 2278, talking about Ibrahim. Huwa sammakum al-Muslimina min qabl. He labeled you, he gave you a name 
of Al-Muslimin before. Here's another ayah from Surah Ali Imran, ayah 36. وَإِنِّي سَمَّيْتُهَا Maryam. I have named her Maryam. سَمَّيْتُهَا This is the verb that's used to provide a name to someone. Not اِدْعُوهُمْ Here's another one. اِسْمُهُ الْمَسِيحُ عِيسَى بْنُ Maryam. His wife's name is Isa, son of Maryam. We've talked about this before. وَجَعَلُوا لِلَّهِ شُرَكَاءَ قُلْ سَمُّوهُمْ And they remanded for Allah partners. Say, name them. Give me their names. Let me know their names. سَمُّوهُمْ And so on and so forth. More examples in this page. So by understanding ayah 3 and 4, we understand exactly what أَدْعِيَاءَكُمْ means. Now, let's analyze this verb. تُظَاهِرُونَ مِنْهُنَّ They told us, and this would be really funny if it wasn't so harmful, they told us in the traditional books of translation and tafsir that تُظَاهِرُونَ مِنْهُنَّ refers to your wives as وَاجَكُمْ as they claimed, which you address by saying when you want to divorce or separate from them, you would tell them, that's what they said, you would tell them, you are to me like the back of my mother, meaning you are going to be separated from me and I'm not going to touch you, I'm not going to go near you, all of this type of imagery that is included in that expression. You are like the back of my mother to me. So that's what they told us in the books of translation and the books of tafsir. So let's analyze this and understand exactly what this verb means and you will understand why we use this translation. Those from among them with whom you collude, meaning you expose information about the community of believers. Exactly as we've been saying since the beginning of the segment. So here we're going to do a number of examples to show you why did the scholars of traditional tafsir and thus the translations mess this up, mess the whole interpretation of ayah 37 and the opening paragraph of Surat Al-Ahzab as we are seeing, as we're discussing. First, it was their inability to distinguish between Muhammad the Nabi for Bani Israel and Muhammad the Rasul for us, the followers of the Quran. And they were blinded by proclivity for salaciousness. What does that mean? You're going to see for yourself. So this relates to the verb ظاهرة. Please pay attention. This is not frivolous. This is really critical, really important to understand that they made so many mistakes as we have demonstrated already. But now I'm going to show you with your own eyes their own inconsistencies, their own erroneous ways and arbitrary ways of assigning opinions whenever they want, whenever it pleases them, including salaciousness when it fits their own mentality. So let's look at the word ظاهرة, the verb ظاهرة, or ظاهرة على, ظاهرة على. Pay attention to this little small alif in here, which is called alif khinjariya, or short alif, but it's pronounced like a full alif. ظاهرة, ظاهرة على. So we're going to look at six examples where they are consistent and clear as to what it means. And all of a sudden, when it comes to Surah Al-Ahzab, the opening paragraph, and another paragraph from Surah Al-Mujadala, Surah 58, you're going to see how they're going to switch and their proclivity for salaciousness takes over. And toward the end of this segment, we're going to analyze why they did this and we're going to understand exactly the disastrous impact of the mistakes made by the books of Tafsir and by extension, the books of translation. So let's look at the examples. The first example is from Surah Al-Ahzab, Ayah 26. وَأَنزَلَ الَّذِينَ ظَاهَرُوهُمْ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ مِنْ صَيَاسِيهِمْ So here I'm not going to read the full translation. I'm only going to focus on this verb ظَاهَرُوهُمْ So according to Sahih International, who supported them? According to Pikthal, supported them. According to Yusuf Ali, aided them. According to Muhammad Asad, aided the aggressors. According to the Oxford translation by M.A.S. Abdul Halim, supported them. According to Sayyid Hussein Nasr, who, as I said, was supported by major scholars from various Islamic studies departments around the U.S. and the world, supported them. So, ظاهروهم in here, ظاهروهم means supported them. And even A.J. Arbery supported them. Great. Let's look at the second example. تظاهرا قالوا سحراني تظاهرا This is from Surah Al-Qasas, Ayat 48. They said, meaning the followers of Musa who rejected him, they said about the Quran and the book of Musa, 
They are two works of magic supporting each other. Tadahara. Again, the meaning is very clear, very consistent so far. Support each other. This is what Pikthal said. Yusuf Ali says, each assisting the other. The same meaning, helping, assisting. Muhammad Asad, supporting each other. Abdul Halim, helping each other. The same concept. And Sayyid Hussein Nasr, supporting one another. And A.J. Arbery, mutually supporting each other. Again, a third example. This is from Surah At-Tahrim. وَإِن تَظَاهَرَا عَلَيْهِ Their translation, you cooperate against him, collude against him, aid one another against him, back up each other against him. Muhammad Asad, uphold each other against him. Abdul Halim, collaborate against him. Sayyid Hussein Nasr, aid one another against him. A.J. Arbery, support one another. And then another word from the same root, ظَهِير, assistance, will back him up, will come to his aid, supporters, Let's look at the fourth example, the same thing. ظاهروا على, ظاهروا على, they aided each other in your expulsion. They helped to drive you out. They supported in driving you out. Backed up each other in your expulsion. Supported others in expelling you. Supported your expulsion. Have supported in your expulsion. Again, there is a fifth example in the notes. I'm going to skip over the next two examples. And you'll see very clearly the inevitable conclusion from all of these translations, consistently in all of these six examples, ظَاهَرَ means to them to support or to assist. And in the case of ظَاهَرَ عَلَى to support each other against, meaning to collude against. It's very consistent in all of these six examples. And then the surprise Watch the sudden arbitrary shift to salaciousness. Let's look at this ayah, ayah 58.3 and ayah 58.2. الَّذِينَ يُظَاهِرُونَ مِنْكُمْ مِنْ نِسَائِهِمْ يُظَاهِرُونَ The exact same verb we have seen in all of these six examples. مَا هُنَّ أُمَّهَاتِهِمْ إِنْ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ إِلَّا اللَّائِي وَلَدْنَهُمْ وَإِنَّهُمْ لَيَقُولُونَ مُنْكَرًا مِنَ الْقَوْلِ وَزُورًا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَعَفُوٌ غَفُورٌ Suddenly, by magic, without explanation, these translators, and by definition, because of all of the books of tafsir upon which they're basing their translations, now they change the concept of yudahirun, the exact same verb. Now they say it is those who pronounce dhihar. What is dhihar? Dhihar is, as Pikthal says, by saying they are as the back of their mothers. So this Arabic concept, this 7th century Arabic concept, enters into the Quran. And they assume Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using the same locution as the locution of the 7th century Arab. Now we don't know for sure if the Arabs of the 7th century actually use the expression. But that's what the books of tafsir claim. Yudahirun, they claim to pronounce dhihar, meaning to say to his wife, you are like the back of my mother. And it's explained further in here, you are as unlawful to me as my mother. Abdul Halim makes it very explicit. This is the Oxford translation. They say to their wives, you are like my mother's back to me. And Sayyid Hussein Nasr commit dhihar against their wives. Again, they're using the locution of the 7th century Arabs to explain what, what these ayat are supposedly saying, being totally inconsistent regarding the same verb. This is the same verb in here, yudahirun, yudahirun, like we saw in the prior six examples. So in the prior six examples, they have nothing to do with sex. But all of a sudden, when he's talking about nisa'ihim, their quote-unquote females, now all of a sudden salaciousness creeps into the books of tafsir and creeps in the books of translation. So suddenly, zahara to them is to say to their wives, you are to me like my mother's back, meaning I'm separated from you, I'm not going to come near you, I'm not going to have sex with you to be, to be plain about it. The question is why? And the answer is, it's a proclivity that we see all throughout the books of Tafsir. Proclivity for salaciousness. Why? Because sex sells. Because all of these stories, all of these books of Tafsir started as stories being used for entertainment purposes, not really to truly engage the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the scripture, in the preserved scripture of the Quran. So to be honest with you, I don't blame the translators per se, but the translators here are used as a proxy to show you that they've taken from the books of tafsir and whatever they've taken, they've just implemented without looking for any consistency in the way they're translating the Quran. Here's another example from 
Surat Al-Ahzab, which is the one that we're talking about. مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِّنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ وَمَا جَعَلَ أَزْوَاجَكُمُ اللَّائِي تُظَاهِرُونَ مِنْهُنَّ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ Sahih International translates this as you declare unlawful as if they are your mothers. Here, Pikthal, you declare to be like your mothers. Yusuf Ali, you divorce by dhihar. He just actually uses a word that the Quran never uses, which is dhihar. Dhihar is what we described as when a man doesn't want to approach his wife sexually, he tells her, you are to me like the back of my mother. And Muhammad Asad even fell into this trap, whom you declare to be your mother's. The Oxford translation, you reject and liken to your mother's back, very explicit. Sayyid Hussein Nasr, you repudiate with the practice of dhihar, again introducing a word that the Quran never uses. And then finally, A.J. Arbery, you divorce saying, be as my mother's back. I hope it's really clear. So they converted this word when it comes to anything related to the feminine or the females, immediately they start thinking in terms of salaciousness. So therefore, when it came to understanding Surat Al-Ahzab, including Ayah 33, 37, salaciousness was already on their mind. And this is part of the tripping that the Quran places for those who are rushing, for those who are interested in the type of interpretations based on the mentality of the 7th century Arabs. Instead, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about something much more important, teaching Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his close companions how to promote and propagate the proper ilm and the proper knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was giving him. So now, for the sake of completeness, I want to cover the traditional translation and interpretation of Ayah 33, 37, which is what we started with, which is related to the story of Zainab, the wife of Muhammad's servant, Zayd. So let's look at the traditional translation and interpretation. Just for the sake of completion, I included them in this note. I'm going to focus specifically on this expression. And you, Muhammad, this whole expression is addressed to Muhammad according to them. And you, Muhammad, fear the people while Allah has more right that you fear him. Accusing Muhammad of not fearing Allah. Please pay attention to the words. These are not innocent words. These are very significant words in our own books, in the books of translations, and even worse, in the books of tafsir, because translations were built on the books of tafsir. So Pikthal does the same thing. And thou didst fear mankind, whereas Allah has better right that, that thou should fear him. According to Pikthal, this is addressing Muhammad. Next, Yusuf Ali, the same thing. It's more befitting that you should fear Allah. The Oxford translation, it's more fitting that you fear Allah. Muhammad Asad, whereas it was Allah alone of whom you should have stood in awe. And Sayyid Hussein Nasr, you did fear people, though God has more right to be feared by you. And Arbery, God has a better right for you to fear him. So therefore, all of these translations attribute to Muhammad that he fears people and it's Allah who instead he should fear. This is very significant, very serious, and it indicates exactly what has happened during the last 1400 years during our tradition. So just as a reminder, according to our interpretation, our translation, is this ayah talking about Muhammad in that way? The answer is no. It is this woman, is taqulu, this woman, this believer woman, is talking to her counterpart, whoever that was, Zaid, some generic person through whom Muhammad was communicating to the rest of Bani Israel. She's telling him, أمسك عليك زوجك واتق الله وتخفي في نفسك ما الله مبديه وتخشى الناس والله أحق أن تخشى. Pay attention to the quotes. All of this in blue are the words of this believing woman talking to another person, Zaid, some unknown person from within Bani Israel. So according to our interpretation and translation, this has nothing to do with Muhammad. Now, is our interpretation and translation consistent 
with the rest of the Quran? And the answer is absolutely. And let's look at this conclusion, which is the malignment of Muhammad in the traditional tafsir and the translations of the Quran. And again, I don't blame the translators, but I blame them for being lazy and negligent and taking blindly, following without questioning, like sheep, whatever they found in the books of tafsir. So here in Ayah 33, 37, they accuse Muhammad of fearing people, and Allah is supposedly more worthy of being feared. But yet in the same surah, in the same surah, they attribute much better qualities and attributes to someone else. Those who convey the messages of Allah before Muhammad. If, the, if you read the context, Ayah 38, as we did earlier, it's talking about messengers before Muhammad. They fear him and they fear no one else but Allah. So those before Muhammad, according to their own translations and according to their own interpretation, tafsir, were better than Muhammad. This is what they're saying. This is the message that's being conveyed. So when our children are reading and comparing and contrasting, what do you want them to understand? When the non-Muslims are reading and comparing and contrasting in the same surah, ayah 39 of surah Ahzab, what do you want them to believe? This is the danger of what we're talking about. The real story is not just about Muhammad marrying Zainab. The real story is right here. They are accusing Muhammad وسلم, of not fearing Allah. And thus, if Muhammad is not fearing Allah, the whole Quran is for naught. The whole Quran is subject to questions. The whole Quran is not reliable and believable. It's a very dangerous story. It's a story that should make your blood boil if you truly understand the impact it has caused over the last 1400 years. And thus, this is why today, in some of the most Muslim countries, so to speak, the rate of atheism among youth is over 35%. Why? Because they read what they taught them in the books of Tafsir and what they taught them in the translations and they see so many inconsistencies and so many reasons to shun the Quran and to reject all religion as a matter of fact. And just to complete this segment, here's another ayah that makes it even more powerful. Ya amanu, man yartadda minkum an dinihi, fasawfa yati allahu biqawmin yuhibbuhum wa yuhibbunahu, adillatin ala al-mu'minin, a'izzatin ala al-kafirin, yujahiduna fi sabilillah, wa la yakhafuna law matala'im, dhalika fadlu allahi yu'tihi man yasha'a, Wallahu wasi'un alim. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those people. O you who believed, whoever among you turns back away from his prescribed order, dinihi, Allah shall bring forth a new community of people whom he will love and who will love him, humble toward the believers, powerful against the disbelievers. They strive in the cause of Allah and do not fear the blame from anyone. Do not fear the blame from anyone. In contrast, the books of Tafsir told us that Allah is accusing Muhammad that you fear people and Allah is more worthy of fearing him. You can see the malignment of Muhammad in how they interpreted the ayat of the Quran in conflicting ways and in ways that make Muhammad look ridiculous. So we should not blame Charlie Abdo and various attackers of the Quran and of Muhammad when our own books are offering us something horrible in the way they interpreted and they translated the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hope this segment has touched you in deep ways. I know the story seemed to be silly at the beginning and I know we have a lot of details regarding the evidence, but I hope you see that with this conclusion, this is perhaps one of the most significant landmark segments on the whole channel. This is really important to understand. It is really important to redress the terrible mistakes that were made during the last 1400 years regarding this story. With this, we come to the conclusion of this segment. Alhamdulillah, alladhi hadana lihada, wa ma kunna li nahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah, laqad jaat rusul rabbina bilhaq. I thank you so much for watching. Assalamu alaikum.